Hello, how are you? Here we are for another little bit of Garth Nix, Drowned Wednesday, which is book three of the Keys to the Kingdom series, if you hadn't remembered. Just FYI, today my laptop is telling me, actually at the bottom of the screen here, it's a near record, apparently, for the 7th of September. Um, one degree off, actually, the hottest temperature recorded for this day in December. So if I'm looking a little bit disheveled, if I'm looking like, I don't want to be sitting in my bedroom, oh, especially with these big things on my ears, that's why it is really hot today. Who wanted an Indian summer? Oh my goodness. Is that why they're called the really long summers? I don't know. But um, yeah, Oof. it is toasty. Oh my goodness. So um, typically, it's a really long chapter tonight as well, so I might pause it a couple of times, go downstairs and get a drink and come back and record a bit more. Hopefully you won't notice that. You might suddenly notice a little bit of a change in position or something. That's when I've secretly gone down to have a cool down. <laughs> anyway, without any further chitter chatter, let's get on with it, shall we? Here we go. The next thing Arthur knew, he was lying on the deck, right up against the rail with his good leg hanging overboard. He could hear screaming all around him and shouting. For a moment, he thought he'd suffered an asthma attack and had passed out from lack of air. But his breathing was fine, or so his mind reported, before it suddenly switched back to the current situation. The splinters flying through the air. Do you remember the um, fever fuse ship had shot a cannon, hadn't it? And it had hit them directly, just as they were about to go through that frame, which was going to take them, or teleport them, out of their current predicament. Arthur pulled his leg in, sat up, and stared around him. He was vaguely aware that, he'd broke, that his broken leg hurt, but that was nothing new. There was blood on his dressing gown, but it was bright blue. A pain in his left hand made him lift it up. There was blood there too, red blood, but not much of it. Arthur focused on his middle finger and pulled out a needle-shaped splinter that had sliced across a knuckle and was still hanging there. Will you look at that? Ruined, said a voice next to Arthur. The boy slowly turned to look. There was a large hole on the far side of the deck. The planking was gouged all around and there was a blue blood splattered all over the place amid shattering wood and splinters. Ichabod was pointing at his waistcoat. A splinter as long as Arthur's forearm was sticking out of the denizen's stomach. Blue blood was trickling out of the wound and into his waistcoat pocket. Doesn't, doesn't it hurt? asked Arthur. He was in shock and part of his mind was telling him to check himself over again. He knew the denizens could recover even from a beheading, but that didn't help. It also didn't apply to him. A wound like Ichabod's would have killed him for sure. It certainly does hurt, replied Ichabod with a grimace. But look at my favourite waistcoat. Arthur looked at his own arms and legs. They were fine. He gingerly felt his stomach and head. They seemed fine too. Only his finger had been touched. The denizens around the wheel had not been so lucky. Arthur could hardly bear to look at them. They were so pierced by splinters. At least the blue blood didn't look so serious as real human blood would. And they were standing and complaining about their bad luck. Seriously wounded to the captain's quarters, instructed Dr. Scamandros. He didn't appear to be injured, but blue fluid dripped from the sleeve of his yellow greatcoat. You too, mortal. You could be killed up here. Get below at once. Ichabod, take charge of our valuable passenger. Arthur struggled to his feet and hesitantly walked to the gangway, Ichabod at his side. Are you, uh, are you going to do something, Doctor? asked Captain Caterpillar plaintively. As he stared below at the spot where his foot and one of his third best boots used to be. I think the cannonball was coated in nothing. You'd feel a lot worse if it was, Captain, said Dr. Scamandros. As I was saying, it is theoretically possible to accelerate the transfer by bringing the portal to the traveller rather than the other way round. It is, of course, exceedingly difficult and dangerous. Everyone looked at the pirate vessel astern. It fired again, a great gout of water exploding out of the sea a little ahead and to the port side of the moth. What could happen that would be worse than eternal slavery? Excuse me. Or a slow and torturous death by nothing based sorceries at the hands of Feverfew? asked Concourt. He didn't really sound like he wanted to know. 
if I fail, we shall transfer not into the secondary realm, but into the void of nothing and be immediately expunged from existence. My collection as well? asked Caterpillar. The ship and everything on it are connected with it, said Scamandros, including all your stamps. So, what are your orders? Arthur hesitated on the steps, waiting to hear Caterpillar's commands. Surely there was some other way. Perhaps he could escape via the infinite stair. No, not in his current state. He probably didn't have the power anymore. I can't have the collection fall into fever for you's hand, said Captain Caterpillar in a small voice. All or, or nothing. Arthur saw Scamandros open his yellow greatcoat. The inside was lined with dozens of pockets and loops for magical implements and apparatus. Scamandros selected two lengths of bronze rod with curved back hooks set near the pointed ends. Though they were in miniature under his coat only a few inches long, they expanded as he dragged them out till they were at least a yard in length. Fire irons, said Ichabod. Match and set. Very nice. Come along. Arthur started to follow Ichabod down the port side ladder to the waist where Sunscorch and the crew had finally succeeded in cutting away the last of the broken yard and its accompanying debris. But Arthur stopped on the companionway to look back. He saw Scamandros reaching out with a fire iron in each hand, the bronze rods continuing to extend until they became shafts of curdled sunlight that reached up into the sky and to each side of the ship. Only a few seconds later, the transformed fire irons reached all the way to the vast, gilt-framed portal of the secondary realm. The hooks on the end were now easily 30 feet long. The irons wavered outside the edges of the frame, then Scamandros brought them in and seated them. As sun bronze met magical gilt, there was a horrendous metallic noise like an angle grinder suddenly cutting into steel, magnified though a hundred times. Everyone on the ship stared up at the portal and the doctor's two levers. Ichabod didn't protest or try to make Arthur go below. Like everyone else, he wanted to see what would happen next. Scamandros shouted something, a word that passed through Arthur like a hot wire, causing him to cry out and clap his hands to his ears. The doctor shouted again and Arthur, suddenly stripped of strength, fell down the ladder to the deck, taking a surprised Ichabod with him. Then Scamandros yanked the fire irons back towards himself. This action was magnified all along their sun-curdled length. With a squeal of ten thousand fingers on a giant blackboard, the entire vast doorway to Forlorn Island shuddered towards the moth. At first, it looked like it was all going well. The portal rapidly grew closer and the moth continued to sail straight at it. Then, when it was only yards away, the portal began to totter and shake, and the top edge started to lean forward. Behind it, in the place of the normal sky, was a dark mass that glittered like some volcanic stone. The void of nothing. Faster! shouted Scamandros, fear in his voice. Make the ship go faster! Denizens, who had been frozen in awe, sprang into action, goaded again now by the unbelievably loud voice of Sunscorch. Yards were trimmed, ropes hauled, sails hoisted where sails were hardly ever seen. Faster! screamed Scamandros. The portal was falling towards them now, and instead of dragging it with fire irons, the doctor was trying to hold it up. Darkness rippled behind us. We must get through before it falls! The portal fell further and the bowsprit of the moth pierced its shining jigsaw crazed surface. Then the bow passed through and the rest bow passed through and the rest of the ship followed. The light changed to a softer golden tone and the breeze around Arthur became instantly warm. At the stern post of the moth past the portal, Scamandros fell to the deck, his fire irons clattering at his side, no longer anything more than the lengths of bronze. The portal, its work done, collapsed in on itself. The threat of nothing was gone. But there were other troubles for the moth. Splashdown! Oh! Splashdown! Brace! shouted Sunscorch. Take hold! Arthur instantly shuffled back and wound his arms through the port side ladder. He knew from the volume of Sunscorch's order that this was serious. The moth had come through the portal all right, but because of the angle of entry, they had not come through at the same level. The ship had entered this new world 30 feet above the water. Now it was crashing down into the sea. Before the echo of Sunscorch's shout had gone, the ship tilted pre precipitously, <laughs> precipitously, I can't say that word, forward. 
Arthur saw Ichabod slide past till a denizen managed to grab hold of a grating. Other denizens tumbled along further down the deck and some fell or jumped from the rigging, though as far as Arthur could tell, they went right into the violet sea. Then the ship struck. Arthur's legs went up in the air, but he managed to keep hold of the ladder. His good foot kicked desperately for a hold as he tried to avoid sliding down to the deck below, which was completely underwater. For a dreadful second, it looked like Arthur looked to Arthur like the whole ship was going to nosedive straight into the deeps. But, though the forward 20 feet or so were completely covered in foaming water, the moth somehow came back up with a violent rolling action that spilled more denizens into the sea. Arthur was covered in spray, but he kept his grip. Gradually, the moth's roll slowed. Ichabod got up, dusted himself with a tsk noise and walked back to Arthur. The splinter that had been in his stomach was gone, but the waistcoat was still sodden with blue blood. Come down below, said Ichabod. I've stopped bleeding, but I have to help the doctor if there's anyone really seriously wounded. Is it safe to stand up? asked Arthur. He didn't want to even guess what really seriously wounded might mean. Ichabod looked around. I trust that's the case, he replied. We have made it clear through the transfer portal. The sea here is quite placid, at least at present. Arthur climbed warily to his feet, grimacing as pain shot through his leg. When that subsided a little, he looked around. Sunscorch was giving orders, but not very loudly. Then his ends were climbing back up the rigging, and the ones who hadn't fallen off were already inching their way out across the yards, getting ready to furl the sails. It all looked surprisingly calm until a denizen stuck his head out at the forward hatch and shouted, Mr. Sunscorch, she's cracked a dozen strakes or more. There's foot, four foot of water in the well. Arthur looked at Ichabod. I believe that means we're think sinking, <laughs> Ichabod said calmly. Doubtless we shall hear more in a moment. Allow me to remove some flecks of wood from your coat. Without waiting for permission, Ichabod started to remove tiny pieces of wood from Arthur's shoulders, reminding the boy how easily they could have been larger splinters that would have killed him. He had to get out of the way as Sunscorch ran back to the quarterdeck, jumping halfway up the steps, and there was a confused milling about going around the, de around the wheel. As far as Arthur could tell, Dr. Scamandros was barely conscious, but he had all of the maps. They needed the maps to work out what to do before the ship sank which was going to happen within the next 30 minutes at the rate they were taken in water. Though Captain Caterpillar and the first mate Concord were both there, once again it was Sunscorch who really took charge. I'm guessing you'll want us to beach her dead ahead on Counter Crab Beach, Captain? Sunscorch asked quite calmly. He pointed at Forlorn Island, which was only a mile or so away. I've been there before more than once. Good deep sand, quite steep. Once we're aground, we can warp her about and careen her. Um, yes, very good. Carry on, Mr. Sunscorch, said Caterpillar. I'm just going to, uh, see to the situation below decks. Counter Crab Beach, eh? Excellent, excellent. Mr. Concord, I believe we may leave the ship to Mr. Sunscorch. Pardon? said Concord. The back of his coat was peppered with many holes, some of them stained with his own blue blood. Oh, oh, aye, aye, sir. They both left the quarter deck, trooping down past Arthur and Ichabod. Neither looked at the boy, and they seemed in a hurry to get back to the captain's cabin. Caterpillar was muttering something about humidity, gum, Arab Arabic, and perforated edges. <laughs> Exciting times, said Ichabod. We don't normally have these sorts of goings on, not for a hundred years or more we haven't anyway. Come on. Can't we stay on deck? asked Arthur as they walked away. He was still feeling a bit shaky after the shock of the cannon blast and, as he had expected, was already having a little trouble breathing now that they'd left the house. He also had little inclination to see the really seriously wounded and had a strong inclination to stay out in the open air. If he went below, he thought he might throw up from reaction to shock. He needed fresh air and distraction. I suppose we might, said Ichabod. The captain and Mr. Concord will be checking over the collection. They won't notice anything else, and Dr. Scamandros will call if he needs me. We shall ask permission to join Mr. Sunscorch on a quarterdeck. Ichabod called up, and after a moment, Sunscorch nodded and waved them both up. The original two helmsmen had gone below to have their wounds treated, accompanied by Dr. Scamandros. They'd been replaced by two of the denizens who had brought Arthur in from the boy. A fine bit of sailing and no mistake, said Sunscorch as Arthur rejoined him. The denizen seemed very cheerful. There are not many as can say they showed the shiver a clean pair of heels. But aren't we sinking? asked Arthur. 
We're taking water, that's for certain, said Sunscorch. We'll be on the beach before she drowns, and just as well, for there's at least a week's worth of repairs to be done. A week? Arthur protested. He coughed as he spoke, sudden anxiety making his chest tight. A week out in this secondary realm might mean a week lost in his own world. He still didn't understand how time worked between the house and the secondary realms, but it couldn't be good to be out here for so long. What if he lost a week at home? His parents would freak out. So would Leafs. Plus, he didn't have any asthma medication, so he might not even survive a week. What if his broken leg got worse? I can't spend a week on a deserted island. You'll have to, unless you're a better swimmer than you look, said Sunscorch. There's precious little on this world. Lots of islands, some things you might call fish and fowl, and a bit of useful timber, that's all. A safe haven from both fever-fused pirates and any nosy parkers from the house. Nosy parkers? Officials, inspectors, quaestors, auditors, you know. Officials? Why would we be hiding from them? Not that he wanted to meet any himself, he said, thought. Too many of them served the trustees who were his enemies. We're in the secondary realms without a license, explained Ichabod. It's the original law and there's fierce penalties to be here without permission. Not that there's much chance of trouble, not since Lady Wednesday's mind went adrift and she ate up all half of her officials and drowned. Avarsa, interrupted Sunscorch. We are still in her ladyship's service. True, true, Mr. Sunscorch, I beg your pardon. In any case, we have good reason to be here, which might prove sufficient excuse said Sunscorch after a moment. Then, although he spoke to Arthur, his gaze continued to roam over the masts and rigging, the ship and the crew. As soon as we're able, we'll be back to the border sea in our business of salvage. Now we must shorten sail. We're riding deep and the sand is soft, but we've still too much way on. Immediately, Sunscorch raised his volume enormously, bellowing out some incomprehensible orders involving clue garnets, bunt lines leech lines and slab lines. These were all met with sudden activity by the crew. Now, all we need to do is get her safely lodged before tea time, said Sunscorch cheerfully, without looking away at the from the rapidly closing beach. Try as I might, I can never get them to give up their afternoon tea. Once made clerks, always clerks, no matter how much salt they taste. The ship slowed as sails were furled, and even Arthur could tell she was lower in the water and more sluggish to answer the helm. But they were only a few hundred yards from the beach, a wide crescent of sparkling sand that looked much like an earthly beach, save that the sand was a very light blue. We'll make it, said Sunscorch, but as he spoke, a bell rang from somewhere deep inside the ship. The peal quickly repeated several times. In answer to it, the crew left their posts, abandoned lines and slid down from the rigging. The denizens, who'd fallen overboard, stopped treading water and started to swim for the ship, showing near Olympic speeds without Olympic standard grace or style. Even the helmsmen made as if to join the throng milling about a grating on the main deck of the ship, till they were physically restrained by Sunscorch. <coughs> Oh, no, you don't, he cried. How many times do I have to tell you? If you're at the wheel, you can't go to afternoon tea. You have to take it in turns. Arthur stared down at the main deck. The denizens were accepting cups of tea in fine bone china cups that appeared out of the grating, even though there was no one below handing them up. Small biscuits also materialised in the air and were delicately taken and eaten in modest bites. The sight of both made Arthur aware that he was extraordinarily th thirsty and hungry, despite the drink of water Sunscorch had given him in the boat. He knew he didn't need food or water, but he felt as if he did. How? Where are those cups coming from? It's one of the things that didn't change when we remade the counting house, said Ichabod. Some department in the lower house is still supplying us with afternoon tea wherever we are in the house or the secondary realms. I would venture to suppose that an order was given long ago and it has never been rescinded. It's quite convenient, of course, and we are the envy of many other ships. Oh, it's a cursed nuisance, said Sunscorch. He cupped his hands around his mouth and shouted, All hands come aft! Hold your cups and sources! The crew was slow to respond and Sunscorch shouted again. The beach was only fifty or sixty yards distant. They're best aft. We might lose a mast when we strike, Sunscorch explained to Arthur, but I'll go forward like as not. Arthur looked up at the two very tall masts and their massive spars and rigging. They had to weigh tons and if one of them came down backwards instead of forward, they'd crush everyone. Take a hold, roared Sunscorch. <gasps> So, we made it. Look, a good 20 minutes there. <laughs> but we made it. Do you think that 
they are on Earth or not. I don't think they are Earth, are they? So, but I'm just thinking of that time predicament. Surely the time isn't going to alter, is it? Because, well, because we're only here, look, in the book, and we know that Wednesday is only going to take a few hours in real world times, don't we? Because it didn't even start until the afternoon, what, half past four in the afternoon. So there's only a little while left of Wednesday. So he's only going to be in there a little while, I'm guessing. Who knows? I'm sure we'll find out though when we read on. But right now, I'm not going to waffle. I really need to go downstairs and have a big guzzle drink. Whatever the weather's like where you are, I hope it's beautiful and I hope that you sleep well. <laughs> See you soon.